This is part three in our series in search for absolute truth. In part one, we looked at reality. The fact that you're here proves the existence of God. In part two, we looked at the revelation of God and proved through prophecy that this book is what it says to be. That is the words of an eternal God. Tonight, we're going to look at, in part three, at interpretation. How to interpret the scriptures. Uh, in America today, you can find hundreds and hundreds of interpretations of the Bible. One group says you can lose your salvation. Another one says you can't. One group says women can preach. Another says you can't. One group says you're not, that tongues don't exist anymore. There's churches speaking in tongues. And they all carry the same Bible and profess to believe the same book. Uh, where they get messed up is interpretation. Uh, I believe both sides are sincere and truly believe the Word of God, but they're getting messed up in their interpretation. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 16, Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now Peter's saying we didn't make this stuff up. We ain't following fairy tales or, or mythology. The story's made up a long time ago. He said we were eyewitnesses of the power of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter was on the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus transfigured. And they saw his countenance that did shine as the sun. And they heard a voice that come from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. They were eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. In verse 17 he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So they seen his glory and they heard the voice of God. In verse 19, he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. He says that we have something more sure than what he heard that day on the mountain. He, we have something more sure than hearing the very voice of God. He said, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. If you take heed unto this sure word, you do well as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. We live in darkness. Christ said, I am the light of the world. He that, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, Christ is no longer in the world. The only light that we have that now shines in this dark place is the Word of God. And you do well to take heed unto that book. He says this in verse 20, knowing this first. Now, if you're, going to, if you're going to put your trust and hope in the Word of God, Peter says there's something you need to know first. As you begin to take heed to this book and to really start searching this book out, Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But he says that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. And yet you talk to people out here and they say things like this. And all you, I've heard, I've, I've heard it so many times, I just get sick to my stomach anymore. People have been in church 40, 50 years making statements like this. Well, I can read the Bible and get one thing out of it. You can read the Bible and get something else. Or this verse may say this to me and it may say this to you. Listen, the book says what it says. And it's not up to you to interpret it. It doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what God meant when he said it. Listen, I, 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 I've made this statement. People don't understand it. Listen, I don't care about what the Bible teaches. I care about what it says. I can make it teach anything I want it to teach by simply changing or ignoring what it says and how it says it. If you truly want to know what the Bible teaches, you must first acknowledge what it says. And there's no prophecy of the Scripture of any private interpretation. The reason that we find ourselves in the mess we're in in America is because men have tried to assert the authority of the Holy Spirit, the author of the Scripture, and interpret the Bible apart from Him. They try to make, they try to do interpretation themselves. They tell you what they think the Bible says. They tell you what they think the Bible means. And there's only one interpreter of the Scripture, and it's the Holy Spirit. 
Every major school in America today, every major Bible school and Christian college in America today is teaching a false system of biblical interpretation. They, make you, they, they want you to believe that it's up to you and your intellect and your knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and your submission to them and the hierarchy of, of American uh, Christian scholarship for you to learn the truth. And there's nothing further from the truth than that right there. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that understanding comes from schools, intellect, Greek and Hebrew, creeds, church councils, traditions, or any other thing man has created. Well, I've heard people when it comes to argue, arguing about the issue of the King James Bible, instead of telling you what the Bible says about the Bible, they'll quote some, some 1500 council, Baptist Convention council, on their stand for the Word of God. I'm not, I don't worry about the traditions of my forefathers. I'm not concerned about church councils and creeds. Listen, it's about what the Bible says. Uh, all those other things are different authorities. The Bible must be the final authority. And uh, every Christian college is teaching a false system of interpretation. Who is the authority when it comes to the Scripture? It's the author of the Scripture. The Bible says that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This book came to us by the Holy Spirit of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction and instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It came to us by inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit moved upon men, and those men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. It, they didn't speak to their own will or through their own understanding. In fact, many of them many times didn't understand what they were writing or saying. Daniel didn't understand his visions. God said, Go thy way, Daniel, seal the book up for the time of the end. Many shall be purified, many shall do wickedly. It's not a, it, it didn't come to us from these men. It came to us from the Holy Spirit of God, and only He can interpret what He wrote. Now, you're warned three times in the Bible. Uh, beginning in Genesis chapter 40, and verse number 8. Three times you're warned in the Bible about interpretation. You've got to have, you've got to have interpretation, or you'll break your neck in the Word of God. In Daniel chapter 40, verse number 8, the Bible says Joseph was in jail there, and he's, he's in jail with a butler and a baker. And this butler and baker has a dream one night. They both have the same dream, a little bit different. But uh, they come to Daniel and say, We have dreamed a dream, and we have no interpreter. Or come to Joseph and say, We have dreamed a dream, and have no interpreter. And Joseph tells them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Do not interpretations belong to God. No man had the interpretation for that dream but God. He said he would reveal himself in dreams. We looked at that in the last message, Numbers 12, 6. But only God knows the interpretation thereof. Interpretations belong to God, not man. And there's no prophecy of any private interpretation. That means you can stare at it till you're blue in the face. You ain't going to get the right interpretation by yourself. Genesis 40 and 8 says that interpretations belong to God. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream over there in the book of Daniel, and he sees a statue with a head of gold and, and, and arms and, and a breast of silver, and then the, the, the torso and the, the thighs were made of brass, and then he comes on down to the two legs of iron, and then he sees ten toes of iron and miry clay. And he has this dream, and he was troubled by this dream, and the next day he wants all the wise men to come before him and not only tell him the interpretation, but tell him the dream. And, then he, and when he doesn't get it, he's ready to kill all the wise men in, in Babylon. But Daniel, Daniel stands up and says, give me time to pray on this thing. And Daniel goes and prays and God reveals it to him. And he comes to King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 28. And verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Let me add the congressmen and the president and the professors and the deans and the, and the educators. There ain't none of them that can make these, these secrets known to man. He says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, 
thy dreams and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. He tells him the dream and the interpretation, and it was given to him by God. In Luke chapter 24, one more place here. Luke chapter 24, 44 and 45. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. They still didn't understand all these things. They didn't understand what, what it was for him to die and resurrect. They, they was looking for a kingdom. They didn't understand all this. So Jesus shows up here in verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scripture. He opened their understanding, that they might understand the Scripture. There's not a Greek or Hebrew professor in America that can do that for you. There's not a Christian college. There's not a commentary. There's not anything in this world that can open your understanding to the Scriptures other than the Holy Spirit of God. Only He can open your understanding that you might understand the Scriptures. Only He can do it for you. I can't do it. Any other man can't do it. I can sit here and speak until I'm blue in the face. If you don't number yourself before God and have the Holy Spirit to open your understanding, you don't have a chance of understanding the Scriptures. Only He can open your understanding. Correct biblical interpretation is arrived at by, number one, having a good dose of the fear of God in you. If you don't fear God, then you'll, you'll never get it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom is the most important thing. Proverbs says this, Proverbs said, wisdom is the principal thing. With all thy getting, get wisdom. Pro wisdom is the principal thing. And the fear of the Lord is the first step to getting that wisdom. You've got to fear God. The second thing you need for correct biblical interpretation is the Holy Spirit. If you ain't saved, you can forget about it. If you ain't born again, you can forget about it. I mean, you can read the cute little stories in the Bible and get some you know, a little bit of history out of it and, and, you know, some of that. But you can't get the spiritual things out of the Word of God apart from the Holy Spirit. When I talk about the new birth, if you ain't saved, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. When I talk about the second coming and premillennialism and all that stuff, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. You're, you, you don't understand the things of the Spirit of God. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are discerned spiritually. That's 1 Corinthians 2.13. And until you're born again, your spirit is dead to God. Ephesians 2.1. Uh, Ephesians 4.17 and 18. You're dead to God. You're alienated from the life of God. You're blind and ignorant. cannot understand the things of God until you're born again. That's why Christ said they cannot see the kingdom of God except they be born again. So you've got to have the Holy Spirit who Christ promised would lead and guide us into all truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you've got to understand the Holy Spirit's method for teaching the Bible. How does the Holy Spirit make the Scriptures known unto us? The revelation of God, or the truth comes wholly by revelation. It has nothing to do with your intellect or anything. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, As it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I can't see it, ear can't hear it, and the heart can't imagine it. What do you think about that? Why NASA's wasting billions of dollars sticking telescopes out in outer space. They ain't going to find any truth out there. Tell me what they found. If I tell me anything they found that solved one of mankind's problems. Men are still dying, people are still starving, and we're still fighting wars. Well, they ain't finding the answers with the telescopes. What about the microscopes? They can cut the atom down, quarks and all this stuff. They can cut it down and investigate that stuff. What problem have they solved? Nothing. Help them make a bigger bomb. That's what it helped them do. Hasn't solved one of mankind's problems. We're still fighting wars, we're still dying, we're still starving. What truth can man find? I can't see it, near can't hear it. The heart can't imagine it. God said in Romans chapter 3, There is none that understandeth. 
None. A none. N-O-N-E, that's Einstein, Socrates, Obama, and the rest of the crowd. None that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that understandeth. You ever thought about that? God looks down at this world and says they're all ignorant. There ain't none of them that have a clue. We ride around in cars and, and fly airplanes and think that we're evolving into some superior creature when we're dumber than we were 300 years ago and getting dumber by the minute. There's none that understandeth. None. All right, he says, but God hath revealed them. The things that God hath prepared for them that love Him, He's revealed them to us, not through intellect, not through knowledge of Greek and Hebrew, not through education. He's revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? The only one that truly knows the things of you is the Spirit that's in you. The only one that truly knows the things of me is the Spirit that's in me. Even so, no man knoweth the things of God but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We've not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, and He has searched the deep things of God. He knows the deep things of God and reveals to us the deep things of God. He says in verse 13, which things also we speak. Now pay close attention here. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Therefore a person filled with the Holy Spirit has a certain vocabulary. He doesn't speak the things of God with words that man's wisdom teacheth. He speaks them with words that the Holy Ghost teacheth. And I'm going to show you how the Holy Spirit teaches you these words here in a minute. But let me give you an example. The modern Christian educator uses words like eschatology. Wow. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to impress you. The Bible said that God knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. God hath made foolish the wisdom of this world, and he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Eschatology is not a word of the Holy Spirit. It's nowhere in the Bible. Pneumatology. That's another Christian educator word. Nowhere in the Bible. Calvin's five points of Calvinism. Total depravity. I'll give you 5,000 bucks if you can find it in the Bible. Unconditional election. No. Limited atonement. Uh-uh. Irresistible grace. Nope. Perseverance of the saints. Perseverance is in the New Testament twice and not one time does it refer to eternal security. So Calvin... We gave him five pitches. He got five strikes. He's out. Listen, not one of them is a biblical word. They talk about the sovereign grace of God, and they, then they make fun of free will people. And I listen, I believe in eternal security, but I believe if a man wants to be saved, he can be saved. I don't believe in this unconditional election, women of the tongue and nonsense. It's not in the Bible. You, you Calvinists running around talking about the sovereign grace of God. Sovereign is nowhere in the, in the Bible. But free will is. Isn't that strange? I wonder who's teaching true biblical doctrine there. Not, not you. Not you and your crowd. You see, the man filled with the Holy Spirit and the man that, that God has revealed the things of God to has a certain vocabulary. He will speak with certain words such as justification, sanctification, Redemption, propitiation, resurrection, rapture, second coming, premillennialism. You see, those are the words that the man of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, uses. Glorification, predestination, election. These are the things that, that they use and, and they talk about. The day that we, we get the glorified body and things of that nature. But these, these are the things that God has revealed to us by His Spirit. And He's taught us these things and showed us these things. And we now speak these things with words that the Holy Ghost has taught us. Listen, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You learn these words and you learn these things through comparison. Comparing spiritual with spiritual. Or as Isaiah chapter 28 says. In Isaiah 28 verses 9 and 10. It says, To whom shall He teach? To whom shall He teach? Show doctrine. Let me get there. 
Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That's a question. Who's God going to give knowledge to? Who's he going to give those, who, who's he going to make to understand doctrine? Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. I've been at this thing 19 years. And I've talked to people since I've been saved, been in church 40, 50 years, that can't hold an intelligent five-minute conversation with me when it comes to the things of God. That's not boasting. That's a sad testimony for the person who's been saved 50 years. You've been saved 50 years, you ought to be able to keep my attention on the things of God for more than five minutes, brother. You know what your problem is? You spend too much time, too much time dancing and speaking in tongues and not enough time with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You're still a babe. And you don't understand doctrine because God can't make you understand doctrine until you've been weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. You've got to grow up. But you ain't going to grow up. Been at it 40, 50 years, still don't, don't have a clue in anything I'm talking about. I talked to you about uh, integration and segregation. You don't know what God said about the issue. I talked to you about civil rights and the women's lib movement. You don't know what God said about the issue. You have no idea. You're still stuck back here with Alice in Wonderland and have no idea what the truth of God is. You need, you need the Holy Spirit to really show you some truth. And He's got to first draw you from the breast and wean you from the milk. For line must be upon, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Comparison. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. A little from Isaiah, a little from Joel. A little from Zechariah, a little from Romans. A little from 1 Corinthians, a little from 1 John. A little from Matthew, a little from Mark. He put it there like a puzzle. And only the Holy Spirit can put the puzzle back together. For example, you go over there to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a dream of four beasts. The first beast was likened to a lion. The second beast likened to a bear. The third beast likened to a leopard. In Revelation chapter 13, John sees a beast rise out of the sea, having the mouth of a lion, the body of a leopard, and the feet of a bear. Don't tell me, brother, you have to have Daniel chapter 7 to interpret Revelation 13. The Holy Spirit teaches you things by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God is not the author of all the confusion you see in the world today. 1 Corinthians 14 says God is not the author of confusion. Let all things be done decently and in order. God is not the author of all the denominations of Christianity in the world. He's not the author of all this division and confusion. He's not the author of all these churches teaching different things, using the same Bible and teaching different things and having different interpretations of the Scripture. God's not the author of any of that. Every heresy in America today and in the world today and every division in Christianity today is the result of men trying to assert the authority of the Holy Spirit and interpret the Scriptures themselves. They'll use one verse here, one verse here. You know, we believe, we believe, they'll say something like, we believe in baptismal regeneration. You're saved by water baptism. They'll have five verses that they use. The Calvinists will run to his verses and the, the free wills will run to their verses and the Pentecostals will run to their verses and all these denominations run to their own verses and, and tell you what they think they mean to try to justify what they believe. That's not me. Listen, I don't care about the Baptists. I don't care about any of that stuff. I believe that book and I stand for that book and I compare Scripture with Scripture. I want you, when you watch these videos, to get your Bible out and go with me to these scriptures and see if what I'm telling you is the truth. And tonight we're going to talk about correct biblical interpretation. Not only correct biblical interpretation, but I'm going to show you the ways that men pervert and twist the Word of God to their own understanding. Listen, listen, let me tell you this about the Bible before I move on. That Bible is the most dangerous book in the world today. It is the most dangerous, deceptive book in the world today. It wasn't only written to save your soul, it was written to damn your soul. You don't believe it, do you? Go back and watch 
part one again. Read what I read or, or, or watch again what I said in there about many shall be deceived. By what? Those who come in the name of Christ. 2 Peter 3, 16 talk about them who rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They twist them to their own destruction. That is, they use the Bible to damn themselves. God said he would take the wise in their own craftiness. You know what that means? That means that book is locked and loaded with a bunch of bear traps to take the wise, arrogant, egotistical, proud man in his own craftiness. You better watch for the stumbling blocks in the Word of God. God said, I've laid in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whosoever shall fall upon it shall be broken, but whosoever it shall fall upon it shall grind him to powder. That's talking about Jesus Christ, but God, oh God has put this thing and loaded this thing to trip you up and to trip you up if your heart ain't right. If your heart is right, you ain't got nothing to worry about. And I said that the Bible's the most dangerous book. Some of you sitting there with your pious little, little face on right now like, oh, I can't believe he said that. That Bible's precious, blah, blah, blah. And it's nothing but a good Lord look charm to you under your pillow or on your coffee table or in your purse. You ain't picked it up and read it a day in your life. If you pick it up and read it, you'd be sitting there shaking your head agreeing with me right now. Well, I can take the book of Acts and preach, a, preach out of the book of Acts. I can preach out of the book of Acts alone four different ways of how to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 37 and 38, 39. You receive the Holy Spirit through repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Over in, over in the book of Acts chapter 6, I believe it is, there's a bunch of men over there that, that, that believe, repent, and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, but don't get the Holy Spirit until the apostles come down and lay hands on them. Acts chapter 10, there's a man that gets it simply through hearing. Acts chapter 19, there's a group of men over there that are baptized twice, have the apostles' hands laid on them, then they receive the Holy Spirit. Four different ways right there. Well, there's four different churches. I just started four different churches out of the same book of the Word of God. I can teach from that Bible that you can lose your salvation, and I can teach from the Bible that you can't. I can teach from that Bible that, uh, that a man is justified by faith and works, and I can teach from that Bible that a man is justified by faith alone. Now don't tell me that it ain't a dangerous book. Don't tell me. I've read it. I know what it says. I've seen, I've seen that book. It's rigged, brother, for you to trip up and fall and break your neck if your heart ain't right. You've got to get that heart right before you ever try to reach true biblical interpretation. Every heresy and division in the church today is caused by man and their own interpretation. In 2 Corinthians 2, 17, the Apostle Paul said, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, not as many. There's that word again. Many. Go back and watch part one again. Many. He said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. That is, there are many that corrupt the word of God and few who don't. The ones who corrupt it are those who don't have the Holy Spirit of God and they try to interpret it for you. Many. James said, be ye not many masters, for we shall receive, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That is, there shouldn't be many masters and many many preachers in the world today. There should be few. But you got many, billions all over, just millions all over the place corrupting the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 again, that was chapter 2 verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 I believe it is, the Apostle Paul says, uh, 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 seeing then that we had this ministry, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in, in, in deceitfulness, or not mishandling the Word of God, using the Word of God deceitfully. He says we, we don't deceitfully handle the Word of God. There are men out in this world, according to Ephesians, who lie in wait to deceive you. They're just lying in wait. I know who you are. I hope, I hope some of you get your hands on these videos. You Church of Christ members never show up until we genuinely lead somebody to salvation. Then you show up, don't you? And tell them they ain't truly saved. You ain't ever done no soul winning a day in your life. You wait for us to lead them to the Lord, and then you come and pros uh, 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 proselyte. 
Lead them to your church. Lead them to think we lie to them. Then you, you, you confuse them for the rest of their life. You're lying in wait to deceive, brother. You Pentecostals are the same way. You wait to one of us leading to Jesus Christ and you shut the door and say, oh, if you ain't spoken in tongues, you don't have evidence of the Holy Spirit. Blah, 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 blah. And you take them and give, you, give them your perversion of Acts chapter 2, don't you? I know your crowd, brother. You just lie in wait to deceive people. Just lie in wait. I'm making these videos out of the goodness to get, my, get, the, get the truth of God out to people. I'm not lying in wait to deceive anybody. I feel sorry for this whole community I live in. I feel sorry for it. I see so much confusion and deception in this area. It ain't even funny, brother. And my heart's been broken and burdened for this area for a long time, and I'm just trying to get the truth out there. But there are so many people that lie in wait to deceive around here, it's not even, it's not even common. Just deceitful. Bible goes on to say that there are those who rest the scriptures, 2 Peter 3, 16, to rest, rest them. They just twist them to their own destruction. We're going to look at how these men do this tonight. That is, they, we're going to look at seven methods of how they pervert the words of the living God. You'll be able to pick them out. Now you take these people, you take these people out here, you Jesus only nuts. I mean, Jesus only. Jesus. And you can't even answer simple questions. Y'all take two verses in the Bible. Jesus said, now here's how you do it. Jesus said, go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then you run to Acts 2.38, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you say, he said baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Over here it says be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ must be the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's how you do it, ain't it? That's how you do it. And then I look at you and say, well, who did Jesus pray to in the garden? Who was the voice that spoke from heaven when Jesus was baptized and what descended in the form of a dove upon him? You can't answer them simple questions. You've, you, you've, you've taken two verses out of, out of this whole book and created a doctrine known as Jesus only. You've destroyed the Trinity by two verses in the Word of God. That's how it's done. What about, what about over there in Acts 2 where that Gentile was baptized in the name of the Lord? Not Jesus Christ, the name of the Lord. Never crossed your mind, did it? You never noticed the difference, did you? Jesus Christ is the name of a man. The Lord is the name of the Trinity. God the Father is called the Lord. God the Son is called the Lord. And God the Holy Spirit is called the Lord. It don't matter to you, does it? That baptism in Acts 2.38 is a Jewish baptism for those who rejected their Messiah. Read the whole chapter. Get your mind off of the tongues and the baptism and read Peter's message. Amen. Knock all the other nonsense off and read what it says. Ye men of Israel. Read it. Then he even gives you Joel chapter 2, but you never bother to go back and read Joel chapter 2. Why? Because that's too much of the Holy Spirit method for you. You don't want to stumble across the truth. You want to keep perverting the words of God to justify your own religion. When you were told to compare Scripture with Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, and you get over there in Acts chapter 2 where Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, but you never go back to Joel and see what Joel said. Never. You don't get it. You never will get it. That kind of attitude. Correct biblical interpretation. Now the first way men pervert the scriptures is they add to them. They add to the scriptures. I'll give you some examples. John chapter 3 verse 5. Jesus Christ said over there, I hate to keep picking on you people, but you make it so easy. You, here's your Pentecostals again. I heard a Pentecostal preacher say one time, Jesus said a man must be born of water and of the Spirit. you got to be baptized. He turned that water into baptism. Can you do that? Can you just take a word that ain't there and say this is what Jesus meant? 
You're going to have baptism every time you see water in the scripture? Are you? You going to turn that water they drink from the rock into a baptism? Every time you see water, is it a baptism? John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus Christ said, Except the man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You added baptism there. Why? Fit your understanding. Won't you read the next verse? It interpreted, it, it interpreted itself for you. You don't have to guess what the water is. You don't have to make it up. Jesus tells you in the next verse what it is. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He didn't say that which is born of water and spirit is spirit. He just said that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So then what is it that's born of water? The flesh. Your mother carried you around in a sack of water for nine months. And right before you entered into this world, her water broke. That, that is a reference to the natural birth. Nicodemus had just asked, can I enter the womb a second time and be born when I'm old? And Christ said, no, 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 you don't get it. Except the man be born of water, that's flesh, and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, a second flesh birth is not going to do you any good. You've got to be born of the spirit, Nicodemus. Now that's what it's talking about. Water baptism is not within 20 verses in any direction of John chapter 3, verse 5. You just made it up. Just made it up. That's what people do. They come and they're lazy. They come across verses in the Bible and they don't understand, so what do they do? Just make it up as they go along. So their congregation will think that they know what they're talking about, and they don't. They wouldn't dare get up there and say, I have no idea what this water is. Anybody got any ideas? No, they got to lord it over God's heritage, you see. Pretend like they know something when they don't. There's another one. You added baptism to this one to the word water. Now you're going to add water to the word baptism in Romans 6, 3, ain't you? You ever heard read it? Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Nine out of ten commentaries I pick up in the world talks about water baptism right there. Why? Just stupid. That's what they are. They're stupid. And I know some of you don't like that kind of talk. But listen, there's no reason for a man, no reason for a man to be making it up as he goes along. Jesus Christ promised you His Spirit, said it would lead and guide you into all truth, that it would teach you all things, show you all things, show you the deep things of God, make you understand doctrine, make you to know knowledge. What are you still running around acting ignorant for? You ain't got an excuse in this world if you're saved. A lot of you ain't. That's the problem right there, a lot of you ain't. Romans 6, 3 is not talking about water baptism. I'll prove it in a second. Galatians 3, 27, you do the same thing, don't you? You know you're not that if many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ. That's Galatians 3, 27. Water baptism, ain't it? Why, you crazy Pentecostals and all you Church of Christ people, that's what you make it. I want, listen, I want you to show this to your family. Y'all all make them water baptism, don't you? You make that one water baptism, you make that one water baptism. Galatians 3, 27, Romans 6, 3, you make it water. And here's how God is. To make sure that you fall and break your foolish necks, He put that in the Bible. Ephesians 4, 5. You ready? There's one Lord, or for, it begins by saying, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That means every baptism in the scripture has to be water, doesn't it? Because there's only one baptism. What if I told you there's seven baptisms in the scripture? You see what kind of God you're messing with? He didn't think twice about doing that. You ever read Matthew 3.11? John the Baptist said, I'll baptize you with water. But there cometh after me one that, who's, who's, who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to un unloose. And then he says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Right there's three elements of baptism already. Three different elements. Water, spirit, and fire. 
That means you're a complete nutcase that every time you see the word baptism in the Bible, you connect it with water. What if it's talking about spirit baptism? What if it's talking about fire? And you, you people running around saying, oh, I want to be baptized with that fire. No, you don't. You didn't read verse 12, did you? You got so caught up in your moment of ecstasy and elation in your little spiritual service, you forgot to read verse 12, didn't you? About that fire. The wicked shall be burned at. Every, the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. You don't want baptized in the fire. You crazy nut you. Run around saying you want things you don't want. God may give you that baptism. I don't know. But there's three elements of baptism. I know that. You can be baptized with water, spirit, or fire. So I know that much, and I know that the word baptism doesn't always refer to water. And then God puts, there's one baptism in there to trip you up and to make you fall and break your neck because your heart wasn't right. I know what the Bible says. The Bible says there is one baptism, but I still teach that there's seven. One of them is found in 1 Corinthians 10 that they were baptized in the Red Sea unto Moses. There's one. John's baptism under repentance, Acts 19, 2, there's two. Being baptized in the name of the Lord, there's three, a water baptism. It was different from John's baptism under repentance or them guys in Acts 19 wouldn't have had to be water baptized again. There's a baptism of fire. There's a baptism of one spirit into one body. There's, there's five right there. The one baptism in Ephesians 4 5 is the baptism of the Spirit into that one body. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you're called, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The one baptism that gets you into the one body with one Spirit is the baptism of the Spirit into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 13. 1 Corinthians 12 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body body. Therefore, when I say as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, how do you get into the one body of Christ? By the Spirit. Not by water. So which one is this talking about? Is it talking about water baptism or spirit baptism? What about this one? As many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, you just add. You just add it to the Scriptures. You didn't compare Scripture with Scripture. You just come to the word baptism and start teaching water. And everybody in your congregation was dumb enough to believe you. And lazy enough to believe you. You come to the word water here and you just added baptism to it. And everybody in your church was dumb enough to believe you. And lazy enough to believe you. There's some of us out there that's on to you. You added to the Scriptures. First, first, or Galatians chapter 5 verse 21. You holy rollers out there, try to get us with this one. But we're not ignorant. Galatians 5 21, Paul's talking about the works of the flesh there. He's writing to Christian people. If you have any doubts about it, go back and read verses 16 and 17. There are people that have the Spirit. Read it. Verse 21, he talks about the works of the flesh. It says, They which commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You preachers running around, that, you, you interpret that as going to hell. You say, you say, oh, if you do those things, you're not going to make it to heaven. That verse didn't say anything of the sort. It didn't say they which do such things shall go to hell. It didn't say those who do such things are eternally damned. It didn't say those which do such things shall not see me or not go to heaven or any of that stuff. It said they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Just threw you for a loop, didn't it? You have no idea what I'm talking about. Let me help you out and explain it for you by comparing Scripture with Scripture. I'm not going to interpret that verse apart from Scripture. It's not a private interpretation. I'm going to interpret it Scripture with Scripture. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, Paul writing about Christian people who have the Holy Spirit, 
He says in verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified together. What if you don't suffer with Him? You're going to go to hell. I want you to get Romans 8, 17 in your Bible and read it and tell me there ain't two inheritances there. There's one inheritance that, that comes, from as, comes from as a result of you being a child of God. If a child, then heirs. Heirs of God. If a child. If a child. Then read it. And, and, meaning in, in connection to not only an heir of God, but also join heirs with Christ if, if we suffer with Him. That is, there's an inheritance that comes for simply being a child of God. You become an heir of God because of the new birth. That's what Peter writes about in 1 Peter when he says that God hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, ready to be revealed in the last time. That is, there's an inheritance in heaven that, that is not corruptible, it's, not, it's undefiled, it's reserved. It's kept there. You can't lose it. How do you get that one? By being born again. Go over there to 1 Peter and read it. Begotten again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see? But there's also an inheritance that comes to, to us if, if we suffer with Jesus Christ. That's right there in Romans 8, 17. If we, if we do the work of God and suffer for Christ, we shall receive this inheritance. Ephesians 5, 5. The kingdom of God and of Christ. And I don't have time. You see, I can teach this stuff in this church and the people know what I'm talking about because we've, we've taught on it before. But I don't have time to give you the whole message here tonight. But brother, there's two kingdoms in that Bible, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a natural, physical, literal kingdom that will be set up on this earth at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that's inside of you that's, that's received through the new birth. But at the second coming of Jesus Christ, both those kingdoms are going to become one. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God will be done on earth through a man by the name of Jesus Christ. A literal, physical man sitting on a literal, physical throne subjecting the world unto God Almighty. But those who commit these things will not inherit the kingdom of God and of Christ. That inheritance is talking about Galatians 5.21 has nothing to do with you going to hell. It has to do with you receiving an inheritance. If you get over to Colossians chapter 3, Verse 23 through 25, it says, Whatsoever you do, do as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Jesus, but he that doeth the wrong shall receive the wrong done in his body. He that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong. Whatever you do, do as unto him, knowing that of him you're going to receive the inheritance, not salvation. Salvation is a free gift of God. How dare you preachers get over there? It ain't no wonder that every person I come in contact with doubts their salvation with you nuts out there preaching the Bible the way you do. You get over there in Galatians 5, 21, they which commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That means they're going to go to hell. And 95% of your congregation, no, 100% of your congregation has a problem with every one of the list. The works of the flesh. Are you flesh? Don't have a clue, do you? Now you got your whole congregation pretending to be something they, they're not. You got your whole congregation either doubting their salvation or walking around pretending to be something that they're not. I don't have any more sin in my body, you lying dog. Not only are you lying, but you've made God out to be a liar. Read 1 John chapter 1 sometime. But they just added the scriptures. 2 Timothy says this. If we be dead with him, we shall live with him. The only condition for you living forever with Jesus Christ is, is to be dead with him. Why well, do I do that, preacher? I just gave you Romans 6, 3. You've got to be baptized into him. If you're baptized into him, you're baptized into his death. But you don't get there by water, do you? You better start paying attention to who you're following. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. 
That's the only condition for living with Jesus Christ is to be dead with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. That has nothing to do with salvation now, does it? Yet your preacher will get up and tell you if you don't suffer with Him, you ain't saved. That ain't what it said. It said if you suffer, you shall reign with Him. But if we deny Him, He also will deny us. Not talking about salvation again. But if we believe not, yet He abideth faithful. That's the verse all of you hate. That's the Apostle Paul right there. Greatest Christian that ever walked and threw himself in there. Said, if we, talking about himself, if we, if we believe not, yet He abideth faithful. He cannot deny Himself and you're part of His body if you're saved. I don't like that. Who do you? Just add something to it somewhere and get rid of it. They'll either add to the scriptures or they'll subtract from the scriptures. I'll give you some examples of this one. Men walk right around quoting half a verse, half a verse. First page of 321. Church of Christ favored. Says baptism doth also now save, or that's how they quote it to you. What about 1 Peter 3, 21? Baptism doth also now save. And you'll look at you'll look look at it and be like, oh, I didn't know that was in there. That's not what it said at all. It said the like figure of which baptism doth also now save. The like figure. Me meaning baptism doesn't save, it's the figure. What it represents that saves. And Peter tells you at the end of the verse, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what your baptism represented. Death, burial, resurrection. And it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that saves you. The like figure of baptism. Baptism doesn't save. It's what the baptism represents that saves you. But they just quoted you half a verse. Didn't even quote you half of it. And quoted you a quarter of it. If that, baptism doth also now save you're dumb enough to follow them and never check them out. They just subtract. Galatians 5, 4, ye are fallen from grace. Uh, they try to get that. I believe in security. And if I had a nickel for every time somebody looked at me and said, Paul said you could fall from grace. Yeah, but he didn't say it to me. He said it to you. You say that I can fall from grace because of sin. But that ain't what Paul said. He said you can fall from grace by seeking to justify yourself through righteousness and works. And you try to aim that verse at me and all of us that believe in security when in all reality it's aimed at you and your kind. Just a blind fool, ain't you? Read, get over there and read it. Get your Bible out with me and read what it says. Galatians 5, 3 and 4. Paul said, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You walk around pretending that you have to, you have to live it. Define it for me. I believe we're saved by grace, but I believe you've got to live it. You can't define it, can you? It's okay for you to backbite and whisper behind people's backs and, and go out here and run out with the piano player and all this stuff. But, uh, but you, you look at a man that slips up and says a cuss word, oh, he couldn't talk like that if he was truly saved. You hypocrite. Blind, blind hypocrite leading a bunch of blind hypocrites to hell with you. Listen, brother, if you're going to put yourself under works of righteousness, then you have to keep all of them. Not just ones you pick and choose. Oh, I don't drink. That makes me better than a drunk. Well, a drunk don't whisper behind somebody's back either. Just have a time with it, don't you? Galatians 5, 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you have justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit do wait for the hope of righteousness. That's what I'm doing. I'm not pretending to be anything I'm not. I'm just an old sinner saved by the grace of God, Amen. trusting in the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Waiting for the hope of righteousness that has been promised to me by God Almighty when my Lord and Savior shall appear. 
John said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God that doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. That's what I'm waiting for. You think you already got it, don't you? I haven't sinned in 13 years. You liar. You're a lying dog. You know what you are? Listen, you're either a sinner that needs the cross or you're a righteous man that doesn't. Quit mixing them. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness came by the law, Christ is dead in vain. In other words, if there was any possibility of you living it, Jesus Christ died for nothing. He died in vain. You can't mix them. You either trust in the cross of Jesus Christ or you trust in your works. But Paul promised you that if you put one ounce of trust in your works, Christ has become of no effect unto you. You fell from grace. Because the moment that it's of works, then it ceases to be by grace. That's Romans chapter 11. Get over there and read it sometime. If it is of grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And I, tell, I tell some guy, hey, Here's $20. It's free. Come cut my grass for it. Why, that wasn't by grace. That was a debt. If I give a man $20 for cutting my grass, it wasn't a free gift. It wasn't grace. It was a debt that I owe him. If I walk up to that same man on the street and say, here's $20, go do whatever you want to with it, that was grace. He gave it to him for no reason at all. They subtract. Subtract from the Scriptures. They pretend like James 1.1 1, 1 is not to the Jew when it says that it is. They get over there, we're justified by faith, not by faith only, but by works. James 2.24. Then they scare every Christian in the world with that verse, don't they? Paul said, which one are you going to believe? I'm going to ask you that. I believe both of them. But I know which one's written to me and which one isn't. And you, you preachers sure do have a time when you get over to James chapter 2 and try to make it fit Pauline doctrine, don't you? Oh, they, they didn't disagree. They, didn't, they wrote the same thing. They not a chance in this world they was writing the same thing. Amen. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 verse 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He comes down in Romans chapter 4 and said, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of a man whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. James said, You see then how that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You say, Sounds like a contradiction to me. It's not a contradiction. We're talking to two different people. Read James 1.1. James to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Oh, that's Jewish Christians. You're adding or subtracting something again, ain't you? Where were you told those were Jewish Christians? If they're already saved Christians, then why does James tell them to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their souls? Ain't no Jewish Christians there. It, it is what it said it was. Twelve tribes scattered abroad. There's nothing Christian in the verse. It's the Jews scattered among the nations. Quit adding something that ain't there. Or like Isaiah chapter 1-1. One, one. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos which he saw concerning Jerusalem and Ju Judah. Judea. Judea. Get over there and read it. Isaiah 1-1. One, one. That vision is not concerning you or America. That version is about Jerusalem and Judah. But you'll have some crazy preacher get up Sunday, I guarantee you, take Isaiah chapter 1 somewhere in America and preach a whole message on salvation by works. Right out of Isaiah chapter 1. You ever read Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 12, chapter 14, where them Jews are going to keep the faith of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God? Never read it, did you? Revelation 12, 14. Revelation 14, 12. I believe are the verses. You never read Revelation 22, 14 either, did you? Blessed are they that do His commandments that He have made, may have right to the city and enter in and eat of the tree of life. Didn't read that stuff. 
Why do some people saved by grace alone? Some people in that Bible saved by doing the commandments. Some people saved by faith plus works. Did you ever, you ever read Habakkuk 1.17? We're talking about biblical interpretation. Habakkuk 1.17, or Habakkuk 2.4, I mean, the just shall live by his faith. That verse is quoted in the New Testament three times, and all three times it's quoted, the word his has been removed. And why did the Holy Spirit do that? See, in the Old Testament, the faith of Jesus Christ hadn't been revealed. Read Galatians chapter 3. I ain't got time to teach you the whole Bible tonight. But read Galatians chapter 3 about before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, the faith which should afterward be revealed. What faith is it? The faith of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.22. Galatians 2.16. The faith of Christ had not been revealed. Therefore, a man in the Old Testament lived by his faith, and his faith was made perfect by works. And his faith was proved by works. Abel, by faith, offered more excellent sacrifice. Noah, by faith, built an ark to the saving of his house. Abraham, by faith, by faith, they did all these things. Amen. But the, but the faith of Jesus Christ requires no works. It's a perfect faith. That faith had not come in the Old Testament. Third thing they do, I'll we'll go through these real quick. The third thing they do is take out a context. As the old wise men used to say, a text without a pretext is a, or a text without a context is a pretext. In other words, when someone takes a text and doesn't give you the context of that text, it's because he has a pretext. He's already got a a man that hides the context of a scripture from you is a man that's trying to prove something to you that doesn't exist. Like Acts chapter 2, 38, pretending that that's the plan of salvation for Gentiles. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized. You'll go to hell like a bullet putting your trust in that. Read verse 37. When they heard, they were pricked at their heart and said, what must we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Now I'll give you, I'll give you the scriptures for that. Daniel 9, 7. To Jews that are near and them that are afar off and the nations that have scattered them. There was no Gentiles being offered a promise there in Acts chapter 2. Every man Peter's speaking to is there for the day of Pentecost. There were from every nation under heaven gathered at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation. There's nobody at Pentecost there during that message that wasn't a Jew. What's being, what's being preached there? What's being preached there is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came. They rejected him, crucified him. God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. And they said, what must we, we, get it, plural, we. They're speaking in unison. What must we as a nation do in spite of the, in, in light of the fact that we crucified the, the, the just one that the prophets prophesied of? Peter said, repent and be baptized. That promise of Joel was to you and to your children. If you repent and baptize as God told you to in Joel chapter 2, then he will give you the Holy Spirit. That's there, there's nothing about a Gentile anywhere in that. You want a plan of salvation for you, you individual people in this world today? Go to Acts 16, 31. Same book, same author. Same physical author, same spiritual author. A Philippian jelly comes in. Thanks, Peter and Silas has gotten away from prison. He's ready to thrust himself through with the sword, kill himself because he's scared. Paul and Silas holler out and say, Do thyself no harm, for we are all he's still here. And that jailer says, Good sirs, what must I do to be saved? Did he say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You say, It's the same thing. Not in a million years it's not. Amen. You're crazy if you think they're teaching and saying the same thing. 
If you think believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved is the same as repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost is the same thing, you're crazy. You can't read and understand third grade English and God's done messed with your mind because you rejected his book a long time ago. Or just pretend James chapter 2 verse 24 is for, for the Gentile, for the church age. When James 1, 1 said it wasn't. You ever read chapter 1 and chapter 5 of James? How did you miss the references to the second coming and the tribulation? How did you miss them? I know how you messed them. You picked that book up without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. I ain't got time to go through all of it. Read James chapter 5. Look at how the rich men are warned. Look at how they've heaped up treasures for the last days. Look at how the Lord of Sabaoth is ready to come back after the latter rain, verse 4. Look at how Job is referenced there. Look at Elijah's reference there to three and a half years. And tell me how you missed every reference to the last half of the tribulation in that chapter. I don't know how you missed it, but you did. You did. You don't have a clue who James is talking to, do you? You don't even have an idea what he's talking about. Have no idea. Hebrews chapter 6, if they shall fall away, you don't have any idea, do you? Hebrews chapter 10, if, if we sin willfully, here's how y'all get around it. Well, I don't sin willfully. It's accident. It's a mistake. <laughs> Every time you've sinned since you've been saved has been willfully. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. If there's not that warfare between the flesh and spirit, you're not saved. But if you are saved, that flesh and spirit wars against each other. And every time that you've gone to sin, the Holy Spirit told you not to do it. And every time you sin, you sin willfully. So what's Hebrews 10 talking about? We'll get to that in another time. But it's contrary to church age doctrine, I'll tell you that. Revelation 22, 14. Those who do his commandments, the rich man. Jesus Christ, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, you know, you know the commandments, do them. We all get over there. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Y'all say, therefore, it's always been the same. Men are always saved the same way. God never changes. Therefore, his thing. If God never changes, why don't you go to Jerusalem to keep Passover, you hypocrite? Why don't you go to Jerusalem and keep Pentecost? Why don't you go to Jerusalem and keep Feast of Tabernacles? You said he's the same yesterday and forever. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you, you use that to say that means they were saved in the Old Testament the same way they are in the New Testament, because God never changes and his plan never changes, then why ain't you keeping the feast the way God told you to keep them? You don't have an answer, do you? You just tear through there just making it up as you go, don't you? That Bible, listen, got Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's true. That doesn't mean his plans. His plans are always in accordance with who he is. That doesn't mean they don't change his plan with man. For example, you couldn't eat meat prior to the flood. After the flood, you could eat meat without limitation. Under the law, you could eat meat, but limited meat. There was unclean and clean. Under the New Testament, it's unlimited again. During the, during the Millennial Kingdom, it'll be limited. And during the New Heaven and New Earth, there'll be no eating of meat. The lamb and the, the lion shall both eat straw. The lion shall eat straw as an ox. No meat eating. But it's always been the same, man. No death penalty prior to the flood. Death penalty after the flood. It's always been the same, man. Same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't it? You see how you use the verse? You see how you use the Bible? You know why you preachers use that verse like that? I had a preacher get up and preach at me one night at a tent meeting. Because I'm a dispensationalist and I believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And he got up and took one verse, Hebrews 13, 8, and said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he'd sit, sit there for a whole you know, didn't go to any other scripture in the Bible, just used that one verse to go on a big rant for 30 minutes about how it's always been the same. You know why you preachers do that? Because you're lazy and you don't want to put forth the effort. 
You don't want to put forth the study to rightly divide the word of truth. So you get up and try to make me look bad using one verse of the Bible. Well, I'll get up and make you use by, you look bad using the whole Bible, bud. How's that? You couldn't, you, you couldn't comment on Hebrews chapter 6 if your life depended on it. You couldn't make an intelligent comment on Hebrews chapter 10 if your life depended on it. You couldn't make an intelligent comment on the four ways of receiving the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts if your life depended on it. You couldn't make an intelligent comment on why is Romans 3 and 4 completely different from James 2 24 if your life depended on it. You couldn't make an intelligent comment on Ezekiel chapter 3 if your life depended on it. Something happened between you and God. He don't approve of you. You understand? Amen. Maybe it's because you were stubborn and hard-headed and just lifted up with pride. It had nothing to do with your religion or your sincerity or your work ethic. He just didn't like your proud, egotistical ways. So he just didn't show you anything. Maybe he knew if he showed it to you, you wouldn't say it. Because you're chicken. Want the backing of, of, of the pot, want the popularity. Balaam. See, I just made them statements. You have no clue what I'm talking about. They override the simple with the hard, with the difficult. I'm going to have to hurry up here. In other words, they take verses that are hard to understand. That's where they break their neck, according to Peter. He talked about how Paul wrote some things which are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and simple do rest to their own destruction. They use what's hard to understand to override what's simple in that Bible. Let me give you some simple stuff as an example. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's so easy to understand. God so loved this world that he gave his Son if you believe on him, you have everlasting life. If you don't, you're damned. John 6, 37, Jesus Christ said, Jesus Christ said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came not to do the will, my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me. Of all that he giveth me, I shall lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every man that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Christ said, Of all that he giveth me, I should lose nothing but raise it up. What are you out here teaching you can lose your salvation for? You an enemy of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ just told you that God's will for him was that every man that come to him, he would lose none of them. And you're out here teaching that he, you can lose it. You're an enemy of God. You ain't teaching his plan of salvation. You're teaching your own. You know how you do it? You take a verse like Hebrews 6. Something hard to be understood that I can pick up 10 commentaries and get 10 different theories on what that chapter is talking about. I can do it. I can take William Newell's commentary. I can take Matthew Henry's commentary. I can take J. Vernon McGee. I can take all their commentaries. Oliver B. Green's. I can take every one of them commentaries and show you ten different theories on what Hebrews chapter 6 is talking about. And yet you're going to take that verse to override the simple plan of God's salvation. I feel sorry for you in the day of judgment. They take what's literal in that Bible and make it figurative. They take something literal and they try to make it figurative. Perfect example of this is over there in Matthew 15. When they come to Jesus Christ and started in on and said, Oh, your disciples eat with unclean hands. <laughs> and Christ basically tells them, you know, it's not what enters the man, not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what's in his heart that defiles him. They get off by themselves and Peter says, Lord, declare unto us this parable. And Christ said, Are you also without understanding that what enters the mouth goes out in the drop, the sewage? But what's in a heart is what makes a man unclean? 
Christ was saying, what do you mean to make known unto you this parable? Peter, I spoke plain, clear as day language. There was nothing figurative or hidden about it. I meant what I said. It ain't what goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what's in here that defiles you. But Peter was looking for something figurative and something literal. It can also work the opposite way. You can take what's figurative and make it literal. They do that, the Catholics do that in John chapter 6. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life, for my flesh is meat and my blood is drink. They say, see, we take that literal. You Baptists don't. You were told, you were told before the flood. Or after the flood, prior to the law, under the law, under grace, you're told under every dispensation in that Bible not to eat or drink blood. And yet you Roman Catholics claim to do it every Sunday. We take it literal. Jesus Christ told you not to take it literal, stupid. He said, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life and shall live by me even as I even as the living Father has sent me, and I live by him, even so he that eateth me shall live by me. You mean to tell me Jesus Christ was living by eating his Father? He's telling you right there, it's figurative. He said, as I live by the Father, ye shall live by me. Then if that ain't enough, he comes down to verse 63 and says, it is the, he said, the flesh profiteth nothing. The word it is the spirit that quickeneth. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. He told you right there that eating his flesh and drinking his literal blood wouldn't profit you anything. The Spirit's what gives life. And he says, the words that I speak are spirit and life. And they turn around and say, I don't understand what he's talking about. I don't have a clue. It's a hard saying. Who can understand it? Thousands of them turn following no more. Jesus turns to the twelve and says, will you also go away? Peter says, to whom shall we go, Lord? Thou alone That's the words of eternal life. He got it. He got it. Seventh way to break your neck in the Word of God is just refuse the light that God's already given you. The best way to make sure God doesn't ever show you anything else is to reject the light that He gives you. And it, it's, listen, we're not, to, we're not talking about the pagans and the heretics out here. We're talking about some of you Baptist priests. That's had chance after chance after chance to finally grow up. I mean, if, if we told you, some of you Baptist preachers, that you, in the next year, you aren't allowed, what do you got to preach? 52 Sundays a year? 52 messages. If we said, this year, you got to preach 52 messages, that you can't preach on separation or soul winning, and you can't preach on blue jeans on a woman, and long hair on men, on a man, or makeup. You ain't allowed to preach on any of that stuff for the whole year. Y'all wouldn't know what to do with yourselves. You know what your problem is? You have to get up and keep teaching and preaching on those things because God won't show you anything. He hasn't showed you anything in a long time, and He's not going to because you've rejected light somewhere in your life and criticize the messenger who brought you that light and cut him off. Said, I don't want anything to do with him. You know what God did? He said, fine, I won't show you anything else and I'll take from you what you already know. And God warned you about that in the Gospel of Mark. Light rejected becomes lightning. God will give you opportunity, brother. But when you reject his truth and reject his truth and reject his truth, he'll just quit giving it to you. And you'll find yourself getting up every Sunday preaching the same thing over and over and over, chasing rabbits, struggling to find your thoughts, struggling to find a message. How can you struggle to find a message when you've got a book that big? How is it that you can only preach on five things over? How is it that you, Church of Christ, get up and can only preach on water baptism every Sunday? And how is it you hyper Calvinists can get up and only preach? on predestination and unconditional election every Sunday. And how is it you free will Baptists can only get up and preach on losing your salvation every Sunday after Sunday? It's a crying shame. That's what's wrong in this area, and I hope 
And I hope that it changes. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for another chance to share your word. Lord, we pray that these videos make it out to the community, that they uh, give people light and truth, Father, that they would uh, get away from the deception that's in this area. And Lord, we just ask, Father, that your will be done uh, in our lives, Father, lead and guide us in the way that you'd have us to go with this ministry. Give, our, give this church a heart uh, to, to get these videos out. Not only these videos, Father, but, but gospel tracts and just be personal witnesses themselves. And we just ask it all in the love and name of Jesus Christ, the great God and Savior. Amen.